One could argue that the battle against the coronavirus began with a tweet. It was way back in January when this virus didn't even have a name yet. It was merely an outbreak circulating in China. Scientists were feverishly working to isolate the virus and sequence its genome. They uploaded the data to several public sites, tweeted the information the same day, letting the entire science community across the globe know where to download all of this important information. Fast forward six months to now, the first coronavirus vaccine tested in humans is showing early signs of promise. Scientists and researchers at the National Institutes of Health and Moderna Incorporated are getting ready for the most critical step: a 30,000-person study. Will this vaccine be safe? Will it be effective? Will you get the vaccine? To answer these important questions, we have with us today Dr. Nirav Shah, an infectious disease physician here at North Shore. Stress is. We know that COVID-19 is an extremely lethal disease, so a vaccine that gets- who's going to explain it all in easy to understand language for all of us, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> for me, I guess. <laughs> Mostly you, though, John. <laughs> I don't need any explanation. I was oh. a bio minor. Oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> My bio minor background uh, ensures that I know exactly what's going on at all times. Really? Well, well, you know what? Let me just interview you. Okay, sounds good. You know, I actually came up with my own vaccine. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's actually it's foolproof. It's called um, wear a mask and stay home. You're welcome, <laughs> world. <laughs> Welcome to the Healthy You podcast from North Shore University Health System, where we explore trending topics in healthcare. I'm Carolyn Starks, and I'm John Hellenbrand. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Shaw. Could you please state your title here at North Shore? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Carolyn. So, uh, my name is Nirav Shaw. I'm an infectious disease attending here at North Shore. I have a few titles. Um, so, I'm a clinical assistant professor at University of Chicago. I'm the Medical Director of Quality Innovation and Clinical Practice Analytics, which means I, I have a hat in quality and in HIT, or Health Information Technology. And then I'm also the um, Program Director of Outcomes Research for Quality and Transformation. So quite a few hats. So not qualified at all to do Un- in this conversation. <laughs> Underachiever? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably. Okay. <laughs> so. It's pretty impressive. I, of course. I'm excited about this podcast because I think this represents hope to me. I want to start talking about the vaccine because I see a lot of hope in what's going on now. And I was hoping you could help us understand why the DNA or the genomic sequence of a virus is important to develop a vaccine. Okay. Um, well, thank you for allowing me to talk about this. I think yeah. this um, is in the minds of everyone. I mean, any data that comes out, you know, the entire stock market kind of goes up and down based on COVID therapeutic yeah. and vaccine data. So um, to understand why genomic sequences are so important, you must understand what occurred in the pre-genomic era. So traditionally, weakened viruses were grown in chicken eggs or more recently in mammalian or insect cells, and the desired components or antigens were extracted. So an antigen is basically a unique protein on the virus that the body's immune system will recognize and create an immune response to. So it looks into its library and says, like, oh, I've seen this movie already. And then yes. it uh, says, like, oh, I know this is a bad movie, so I'm going to go and just erase it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this process of extracting that kind of antigen can take about four to six months to get it right to get the right antigen for an existing virus such as influenza, where we know a lot about the virus. In the setting of a novel virus such as SARS-CoV-2, and SARS-CoV-2 is the virus name, COVID is the disease name or the syndrome name, Um, it can take years. Under normal circumstances. It can take a long time. Like a decade, right? It can take up to 10 years, yeah. Given the speed and lethality of COVID, this is just not practical. So Labs are turning to gene-based vaccines that utilize the SARS-CoV-2 genome. All of these vaccines are really targeting one specific protein. It's called the spike protein, and that's a little protein that juts out of the SARS-CoV-2, and that's what's used to kind of bind onto the human cell. 
Um, and um, that's what allows it to kind of stick to it and then deploy kind of the genetic information. So everyone is essentially targeting that spike protein. So people should imagine the graphic images they've seen of the coronavirus with the spikes coming out. That's what you're talking about. There. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. Hmm. Interesting. All right. And that's why it's called coronavirus, because it resembles a crown. A crown, right. right. And that's, those are the spikes. <clears throat> oh. So it's all the, coming together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See how okay, much you learn on this? Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the development cycle of a vaccine from lab to clinic. You've already mentioned there's dozens of pharmaceutical companies out there in the preclinical phase now for COVID-19 vaccine. So these are private labs and labs funded by the government. And uh, this is the preclinical phase where scientists are giving the vaccine to animals, such as mice or monkeys, to see if they produce this immune response. So what bar needs to be reached at this stage for scientists to start testing this on humans? The main thing they're looking for is vaccine toxicity. And Which is what? Vaccine toxicity is really, are there any adverse effects that are occurring oh, okay. to the animals You know, at this stage? So are they developing any reactions? Are they not tolerating it, essentially? If there's any kind of issue in terms of um, what I mentioned as toxicity or adverse reactions to the vaccines, they stop the trial. You know, They don't go any further. Then what they do is they look to see if there's an immune response that's prompted. If there's an immune response and there's no toxicity, then they'll continue to human trials. Excellent. So phase one is the safety trials. So this is when scientists give the vaccine to a small number of people to test the safety and the dosage and, like you said, stimulates uh, the immune system. So I'm so curious, how do they find guinea pigs for this stage? So, uh, like you said, phase one trials are generally 10 to 100 subjects. Um, and for phase one trials, investigators are really looking for healthy volunteers uh, willing to trial these early vaccines where there you know, could potentially be a chance that they can develop a reaction. So this is, uh, this is the thing with clinical research. You, know, you, have to, you have to advertise. You have to get interested people. Um, they have to understand the risk before they kind of go forth with that. I think with some of the early volunteers, I think they were really ready to kind of trial it out because it seemed like they they felt like it was kind of a moral imperative and duty to Mm -hmm. kind of Mm -hmm. help out with this. Um, For these types of vaccines, the risk is exceedingly low because, you know, we're using we're not using live attenuated COVID, right? You know, Mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2. But the question is, could there be some kind of immune reaction um, or something where the immune system goes haywire? Like an allergic, almost. Almost like an almost. allergic reaction, something <clears throat> like that. But, I mean, the risk is still incredibly low. So phase two is expanded trials. And, and we have companies, pharmaceutical companies now in this phase, where scientists give the vaccine to hundreds of people um, split into groups. I guess, does that mean uh, placebo and... So generally, phase two is not placebo. Okay. So they're really interested um, in again: is the vaccine safe? So they're having you know more patients that are or more subjects that are trying it. Um, and in this phase, they're also really interested in understanding the strength of the immune response, not so much whether there is an immune response. And then they're interested in kind of um, how that um, strength varies based on dosing. So are there different sets of doses that allow for a greater response? Um, so that so they, they, they're trying to, uh, as you get more and more people, you're trying to assess more about kind of the, the actual response. That makes sense. Okay, so phase three, the efficacy trials, uh, when scientists give the vaccine to thousands of people. And I'm wondering what kind of control measures are put in place at, at this phase. So in phase three, the goal is to see if the vaccine safely prevents infection in um, disease across uh, thousands to tens of thousands of subjects. So this is a randomized controlled trial with one group receiving vaccine and the other group receiving a placebo. So in this phase, investigators are also very concerned about vaccine safety. That's kind of a recurring theme and are diligently monitoring for any concerning findings. So if there's any finding that suggests there's any risk of adverse uh, events in this larger population, they're going to be concerned when they deploy it across a general population that there may be issues. So this uh, investigators are going to be very careful about this in this phase. The, the other main thing with phase three trial is because you have a intervention group and a placebo group, you can see if the vaccine actually works. 
and compare it across the uh, the placebo uh, mm-hmm. group. So you know the what they're looking for is to see did this reduce infections in the intervention group as compared to the placebo group. So that's that comparison that you don't have in the prior phases of this. And then in terms of safety, these clinical trials have independent data and safety monitoring boards, and they're called DSMBs for short. So DSMBs are mandated to ensure the continuing safety of current and future participants. They also review the data at interim predefined checkpoints to assess whether there is overwhelming evidence of efficacy or lack thereof, such that the initial assumption that there is not one better intervention between the experiment and control groups. So for example, so if there's information that the experimental group and the, uh, the vaccine candidate is clearly protective, the DSMB can stop the study early because it's already shown that this is protective and the placebo is no longer at an equal footing with the vaccine. And in opposite, if you find that the vaccine is not protective and is causing adverse reactions, the DSMB can stop the vaccine trial early uh, before it kind of completes just because there's concern that there is potential risk of adverse effect or no benefit, et cetera. So, so these, are, um, these are things that the DSMB does to ensure kind of um, an additional layer of safety, in addition to having a preclinical phase one, phase two. So there's multiple layers of safety that are going into this. So the, the one thing that I'd like to stress is we know that COVID-19 is an extremely lethal disease So a vaccine that gets vetted through these uh, different checkpoints, these different phases, it's going to be safe. And it is going to be extremely important that everyone gets vaccinated because that's the only way we're going to get herd immunity. And if we don't have herd immunity, you know, what we're seeing right now in the U.S. where just kind of 70,000 people are getting infected on a daily basis, I mean, this is just going to continue, right, if we don't have this kind of herd immunity. In this unusual circumstance with this pandemic, can you skip a clinical phase to kind of ratchet up very quickly, like like warp speed? Right. So trials that are combining different phases, phases two and three, and they're just kind of rapidly kind of, you know, there's a checkpoint there that, you know, allows you to continue on to phase three as opposed to doing phase two, looking at the data, then restarting with phase three. So there's ways that you can do that. Warp speed is there to kind of speed up how these clinical trials are done, and it's also to speed up the deployment. So some of these genomic-based vaccines, there isn't an existing infrastructure to mass deploy these vaccines. So warp speed is helping to build up that supply chain and that infrastructure. So if that vaccine candidate shows to be effective, safe, that they'll be able to deploy it faster than if they were just kind of working on their own. Um, Getting back to your original question, how do you speed this up? So they're actually looking for subjects who are at high risk of getting COVID-19, right? So, I mean, ideally, they want to get across the entire population, but they don't want people who just kind of quarantine at home and wear a mask 100% of the time and have very low risk of getting this. Because the only way you're going to see that effectiveness of that virus in that phase three trial is to see if people are actually getting the virus and not. Right. So they want people sense. like the essential workers, healthcare workers. Yeah. There's a lot of national discourse on how this is um, kind of exacerbating existing disparities. So they want people that are black, brown, that are at higher risk of capturing this nursing home patients. They, mm-hmm. they want those types of patients as well to be part of these studies because that's the way that they're going to see if this is effective or not. So there are four phase three clinical trials that are getting stood up across the U.S. this summer and fall. Moderna is the one that has been in the news. Um, And so they're going to need tens of thousands of volunteers. If you're interested in volunteering, how do you do that? There's a website, actually. This website will handle registration for these large vaccine studies and any others that follow. And then on this website, anyone interested in joining a vaccine study can fill out a quick questionnaire. Um, It's called Coronavirus Prevention Network dot org that is a super long name but coronavirus prevention network.org and so that's looking for volunteers for covid-19 vaccine trials so tell me how you feel about the coronavirus vaccine well i have a 4-year-old son and throughout his life so far we've 
followed our pediatrician's recommendations for, um, you know, what vaccines he should get and on what schedule. Follow my primary care doctor's recommendations for which vaccine I should get. Um, so I would plan to do the same for coronavirus. I have faith in the FDA and in my doctors that they would make a recommendation that's best for us. Do you have any reservations if you compare your feelings about how you get the flu vaccine compared to a new vaccine? My only recommendations would be, since this is such a new virus, um, just making sure that it's gone through the proper testing. Um, but like I mentioned, I do have faith that the FDA wouldn't put something out on the market unless it was reliable. And as far as the vaccine, my understanding is that it would be somewhat similar to the flu vaccine where the, the virus could shift and there could be new strains. So it wouldn't necessarily be a um, like a bulletproof solution, but, um, you know, hopefully would help to guard us against the most prevalent strains of the disease. And can I get your name? Sure. My name is Melissa. So we've read a lot about the virus mutating, and I'm wondering if there are many different strains out there, how this affects the efficacy of a vaccine. Like, you know how we know about the flu and how right. they try to find this dominant strain? Right. And maybe you can explain the difference between like a mutation and a, and a strain, if there is a difference. Right. So, I mean, mutations result in different strains. A mutation is, you know, is there a change in the protein or the genetic information that then results in a change in the machinery of the virus that changes how it affects the host cell or affects the, you know, the human host um, and there are various different strains, we call them clads, of this virus. There's a recent article in Cell where they describe that there is one strain that is affecting the spike protein. Remember, the spike is the protein yeah. that goes and attacks kind of the human cell and allows the genetic information to go in and really is the, the key component that drives the infection. And so uh, this article in the journal Cell basically said that there is a point mutation. So there's a single amino acid change on the spike protein that's resulted in it being more infectious. And so there, there are two main kind of strains related to this uh, mutation on the spike protein. And the one, uh, one of them that is causing more infectivity that has kind of taken over kind of what we're seeing in the population just because it's just more efficient at transmitting the genetic information. It's not showing that it's more lethal. And, uh, you know, this is an initial paper, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done to kind of really understand what this means. But that the fact that it's occurring on the spike protein may have some, I mean, we probably have to think about what does that have to do with the eventual kind of vaccine targets? Because if we're all targeting the spike protein, and if the spike protein changes, oh. um, does that affect the vaccine efficacy? And, and generally, the um, you know, what's interesting is this uh, SARS-CoV-2 tends not to mutate that much. Um, it has machine- Which is good. Yes, which is very good from a vaccine standpoint. So it has machinery in place that helps it to prevent that type of mutation. Um, and so that uh, that's one of the reasons why I think people are more optimistic about the vaccines. It's not like you know, the flu where every year you got to keep changing the vaccine based on certain proteins that keep changing seasonally. Um, this, uh, you know, the, the proteins that are being um, targeted tend to be relatively conserved, meaning even with, you know, these small changes, you know, there's feeling that these um, vaccine candidates should be okay. When you first started hearing about this, did you know this is going to be a marathon? And if so, did you think we would be where we're at today in the United States? A good question. Um, I uh, I think there's a general consensus among ID physicians that this is here to stay and that this is not a sprint. I mean, it was initially a sprint with the initial surge, but there's a very early recognition that this is a marathon because it's going to take time for the vaccine to get developed and then we understand that, you know, deployment also is going to take some time. You know, there isn't a vaccine that's providing some kind of herd immunity. The positivity rate, uh, the number of people who've been infected is still very low, right? It's still under 
So there isn't herd immunity from that standpoint. And I think with the messaging that's kind of been delivered, I I think it's very easy to get complacent or to not really consider how bad this is. So seeing these spikes that are occurring, to me, seemed inevitable, just because if you don't do the things that you mentioned, the masks, the hand washing, the social distancing, you know, avoiding pool parties where, you know, you're crowded in or avoiding bars or or choirs where you're singing. You know, if you can't do this, this is just going to take hold again. If you had a message you could give to listeners in terms of what to expect in the next a year or two years, you know, in terms of hope or just keep going, what what, what do you think you would say? I think... I think think about this in the historical context. You know, we've had, we've surpassed World War One lives that uh, um, we've lost. We are about a third or a fourth of World War Two. The um, the mother of all pandemics, as I called earlier, um, the pandemic flu in 1918 was 600,000 deaths. I think we are kind of still in the early stages. And people need to recognize, and this is not just kind of old people who are immunocompromised, but I think young and old have to recognize that this is extremely serious. This is kind of once in a generation, once in a hundred year kind of pandemic. And they have to listen to, I think, the experts that have the most understanding as to what's going on peel back all the political kind of discussions that are going and look at the hard facts and do the basic things in order to take care of yourselves, take care of your families, and be safe. I mean, we will get through this, but this is very serious. Uh, And how long it's going to take, you know, once we have the vaccine, you know, by the beginning of 2021, it's going to take some time to deploy this across a global population. So, and then even after that, we'll we'll really have to kind of see where this goes. So it's not clear how long that immunity will last uh, and how long the immunity will last if you get this. So uh, this may be a new normal, but I, I am hopeful. You know, we're learning very quickly what treatments, um, that there are new treatments that exist. Science has come a long way. You know, the fact that we don't have to wait a decade for a vaccine is extremely, extremely helpful. You know, that science will prevail kind of in this. We just have to let it prevail. And, I love that. Yeah, and we and we, and we really should not get complacent. This is serious, and um, protect your loved ones and protect yourselves. Wear a mask. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the expertise and your insight and the, the explanation of the from, – from lab to clinic. And I think the vaccine is going to bring a lot of hope and – I want to be Dr. Nir Afshaw. I want to grow up. <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> or weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. You've been listening to the Healthy You podcast at North Shore University Health System. Stay safe, wear a mask, and thanks. <laughs>